All right. Any questions from the last time we were talking? You know, so we're just starting to get into our penicillins. We learned a lot about how we're going to decide the antibiotics we're going to use. Learned a lot about what else we learned about concentration versus time-dependent killing. Anyone remember the difference there? The post-antibiotic effect. Which one has post-antibiotic effect? Concentration. If concentration-dependent killers have con uh, have post-antibiotic effect, what is the post-antibiotic effect? Even the levels are low and below the MIC, you're still killing off bacteria. Good. And versus the time dependent, what's important about that? You need to be above the MIC, which means you probably need to give the drug more frequently in order to keep the drug above that for, for longer, right? So again, usually every 12 at the minimum, but usually every eight, every six hours. But again, a lot of that can be dependent on things like organ function, right? So if the kidneys are so bad that they can't clear the drug, in some cases, a drug I may only give uh, in a normal patient, Q6 hours, I may give only Q24, right? Uh, if their kidneys are so bad that the levels stay high above that MIC for that period of time. So it's all going to be dependent. And again, you'll find all of that when you're looking these drugs up specifically. We'll talk about renal dose adjustment here again anyway so we're talking about penicillins remember how the penicillins work as a class they inhibit the they have a beta lactam group right remember it kind of mimics portions of the the peptidoglycan walls uh, on the bacteria but more specifically they inhibit which enzyme the penicillin binding protein, right? And that was responsible for making those cross linkages within that wall. So by inhibiting the uh, penicillin binding protein, you prevent the wall from being made. The integrity goes down, the wall opens up, and then you lyse out all those contents of the bacteria, right? So again, if you were thinking whether penicillins are bactericidal versus bacteriostatic, you would say bactericidal, right? So they're going to kill off this bacteria. Good. <laughs> So moving forward, we had our regular plain old penicillin, right? We had a couple forms we had of that. We had like the bicillin, which can give intramuscular relief for a good, nice long acting effect. We had the uh, penicillin VK, which route do we give that by? Oral. That's oral, right? And then we had just the regular penicillin G. That's going to be the IV form you see there. Then we had the amino penicillins. What two groups, uh, two drugs we have there? Ampicillin. Ampicillin. Then amoxicillin, right? And then we talked about the beta lactamase inhibitors that we can add on to things like amino penicillins to extend their coverage, make them more resilient to the beta lactamases that bacteria may produce. You get a lot more anaerobic coverage, as, as we saw. Um, and so that's where you have things like augmentin, which is amoxicillin plus clavulonic acid. We had uh, ampicillin plus sulbactam is going to be uh, unison. That's the I, that's a good IV drug we use quite frequently uh, in the hospital. But yeah, those are two big ones you're going to use very frequently. Augmentin, PO, great antibiotic we use all the time. Going forward, we next have our penicillinase resistant penicillin. So this is actually a different enzyme that the, uh, penis, the bacteria can produce called penicillinase. And so these are also termed the anti-staphylococcal penicillin. These are actually the first ones we had that had any activity against MSSA, right? So this is where we have things like nafcillin, we have oxacillin, and then we have dicloxacillin. Uh, these don't get used too, too frequently as I see anymore. Very frequently, we're either streamlining down to one of our amino penicillins or we're going to be using one of the bigger guns, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes here. But they have their hallmark effect of really just working against staph aureus. But specifically, what type of staph aureus? It needs to be methicillin sensitive staph aureus. So the yeah, methicillin would have fit into this group too, but we don't use methicillin clinically anymore. For why, I have no idea. It's never been since I've been working. Um, but nafcillin, oxacillin, dicloxacillin are the three that fall into this category. So MSSA, they will cover. MRSA, they will not, right? Because methicillin resistant is automatically telling you that you're going to be resistant to penicillins. No problem. So anyway, so again, um, you're going to find, though, that uh, as we get more and more prevalence of MRSA, you're going to find we're going to need bigger guns for that. We're going to talk about vancomycin a little bit later. That's going to be one of the hallmarks, uh, one of the, the first-line drugs you're going to go to for MRSA coverage. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, again, remember, this is uh, going to be given pretty frequently because, again, this is going to be um, a, a time-dependent killer. Uh, and again, the monitoring is going to be very similar here. Again, looking for renal function, looking for issues with hepatic function over time. Uh, obviously, monitoring for CBC for not only the you want things like the white count to go down, right, showing that your infection is clearing, but also looking for things like platelets and hemoglobin, hematocrit, all that good stuff too, right? But again, though, going back to the stoplight uh, sort of analogy here, it's very good for gram positives, MSSA specifically, not really good for much else, okay? So very kind of specialized sort of use. Now, remember when we said when you first start off treatment for uh, an infection, do you 100% know what the bacteria is causing the infection? 
No, right? So you want to start off with something with a very broad spectrum, meaning you have a drug that's going to affect many different bacteria, and then you narrow it down. So this is a good one where if I have a patient who, say, starts off with the cellulitis, I'm giving them something like, um, say, a, a good broad spectrum antibiotic, but then it comes back MSSA, that's great because then I can then downgrade them to something that has a very narrow spectrum like dicloxacillin. Very narrow spectrum only really affects MSSA for, uh, for the most part. And so by using that narrow spectrum, what's the benefit of that? You're more targeted, but you're also limiting the amount of things like resistance that can develop. Because again, bacteria, um, when you give these antibiotics with broad spectrum, they kill everything, not just the stuff you're trying to kill, causing that infection. GI tract gets, it takes a hit, you know, other things are going to become more resistant over time. That's something to think about. Okay, up next we have our anti-pseudomonal penicillins. These are really, really good IV sort of antibiotics that are going to be used very frequently in uh, ICUs. We use it a lot for empiric coverage in, you know, a lot of healthcare acquired sort of uh, a disease state. So I think about this a lot when you have, you know, a little lady or man coming in from the nursing home, right? So again, the nursing home still consider the healthcare arena. So when they come in with stuff, do you think they're going to have very susceptible bugs or they're going to have pretty resistant stuff? Because again, they're living with all these other you know, chronic health issues and things like that with all these other patients that are in those facilities. Mm -hmm. They're going to be coming in with lots of resistant bugs. So it's good to use something very broad spectrum. And this is one of the things we oftentimes will give them, an anti-pseudomonal penicillin. So when I say anti-pseudomonal, that means it probably has good activity against pseudomonas, right? And remember, that's one of those big buzz bugs that I mentioned that you want to prick your ears up to, right? So this has good pseudomonal coverage, okay? So, uh, pseudomonas virginosa, gram positive or negative? Gram negative, right? So the, the ones we find here, and again, I don't really see piperacillin being used by itself very frequently, but most often you're going to see piperacillin mixed with that tazobactam. And remember what tazobactam was? The beta-lactamase inhibitor, right? So we're already adding it on with something else that's going to help to increase that spectrum. So that's called zosin. If you ever hear of zosin, that's what we're talking about is piperacillin plus tazobactam. Okay, very broad antibiotic coverage, has good coverage against things like MSSA. So it has some activity against MSSA, but no MRSA. Okay, something to note there. And then it has good anti-pseudomonal activity. So if I have someone comes in who maybe has a polymicrobial infection, meaning you have multiple bugs causing the infection, this is good for that because it has broad coverage. This is good for nosocomial infections, which nosocomial just means? Yeah, we gave it to them essentially, right? They were in the healthcare uh, field, or realm and they, they acquired this infection. So especially pneumonias. So you see this where like, you know, really nasty um, UTIs maybe developed into sepsis or pneumonias or healthcare acquired, things like that. This Zosin is a good coverage uh, for those. Notice here, we also have good coverage for intra-abdominal infections. And again, when you think intra-abdominal, you think what types of bacteria? Oh. You think gram negatives, right? Broadly, right? So things like E. coli, Klebsiella, et cetera. What else do you think broadly? anaerobes, right? So one of the anaerobes and gram negative. So because this has good anaerobic coverage and good gram negative coverage, this is good for an intra-abdominal infection. So a good example of this is when we have someone who comes in to the peds ER and we suspect they have a perforated appendicitis, guess what? We're worried about those bugs spilling out from the GI tract into the intra-abdominal space. We can give them zosin. It's going to cover all those bugs and make sure they don't develop an infection there, right? Because again, once they get that more kind of diffuse sort of infection, things get pretty bad pretty quick. So we want to prevent that from occurring. And then obviously pseudomonas, those are the big things we're going to use zosin for as well. Okay. Now, looking at this, again, this is a time-dependent killer, just like all the other penicillins, so given it pretty frequently here. And in fact, in some cases, we'll actually give this a, a, what we call a, over an extended infusion, where actually, instead of giving the drug, say, over 30 minutes, we'll give it over four hours. And the benefit of doing that is you're going to be giving it as a constant infusion for four hours, so you stay above that MIC for a pretty long period of time. They've actually shown some mortality benefits uh, from that, which is nice. But again, watch the renal function, because thinking back to physiology, assuming you guys didn't all dump that, Remember, think about what happens when your body gets hypotensive. Where does it want to shift blood to? The brain and the heart, right? You need those two to, to maintain life. Other organs can take a hit. Often, which organ is going to take a hit that helps to maintain things like blood volume and et cetera? The kidneys, right? So again, if you have a patient who's got a really rocking infection, they're developing sepsis, they get hypotensive, they tend to take a hit to the kidneys. And so because of that, you can have a patient comes in, you're going to monitor their serum creatinine to make sure your creatinine clearance looks good, but you need to reassess that sort of thing, especially because we talked about when you're putting patients uh, who are hypotensive, you got to get their blood pressure up, right? And what kind of endogenous substances in the body were used to increase blood pressure? Angiotensin 2, which we don't have like a drug to actually increase the angiotensin 2 effects. That's no good. What else do we have? ADH, so we can give vasopressin. So we can give vasopressin to cause vasoconstriction, but that's going to hit the kidney as well, right? What else can we give? What else does our body release, say, from the adrenal glands? Adrenal 
epi, yeah, norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? So norepinephrine from the uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine from the adrenal glands, right? So those are all going to be used. And we use those exogenously as drugs to increase that blood pressure, right? So all of those are going to shunt blood away from the kidneys, and thus your kidney function is going to go down. So you've got to make sure you're watching for that because you know, patients may need it every six hours at first, but then you go back and look, their creatinine's doubled, and all of a sudden you say, well, maybe I need to give every 12 hours. Every, every 24 hours, who, who's to say, right? So um, you need to monitor for this stuff over time, right? Monitoring is going to be very uh, much the same. Hyperactive, uh, adverse reaction is going to be very much the same here um, as far as the other penicillins go. So nothing really new from, the, from that sort of standpoint, okay? Does that make sense as far as like the kidney function, how that can really change? Um, you can really find some, some drastic differences as a patient comes in, has this kind of developing sepsis, and then as they improve, you'll start to see that it may improve as well. Sometimes the kidneys take a while to pick back up, but they, they ultimately can improve for most patients. Okay, so those are the penicillins. Those are the main groups of penicillins we're gonna be looking at, right? So you think, wow, there's a lot of drugs in the penicillins. Uh I hate to tell you, but there's a lot more of them that go in the cephalosporins. And I, I don't know why they kept doing this, but oftentimes what you find is that with these drug companies is once you, they find one drug that kind of fits into a certain niche, um, those other companies will come along that we want a drug just like that too. And then that's why you end up with like, you know, 14 different ACE inhibitors and a million different beta blockers. Some of them have their specific uses, but again, you're going to find there's a lot of drugs that kind of fit into the same category. But moving on. We're going to talk about our cephalosporins, okay? So these groups of uh, drugs are going to have different activity as compared to penicillin, but they're going to work exactly the same as far as a mechanism of action goes. Because what do you notice right here? The beta-lactam ring, right? So it's going to do the same thing as far as inhibiting penicillin binding proteins. It's got the same mechanism of action, so no, no difference between those two. Okay. Um, the other structural things you're going to see here that are going to be different are going to be things like uh, this ring here, and then the R chains are going to be changing as well. So one of the big things you worry about whenever you have a patient comes in, they say, oh, I have a penicillin allergy, is you want to be at least cognizant of the fact that they could have a cross-reactivity with a cephalosporin, right? So we'll talk about these drugs, but someone says, well, I can't get Keflex because I'm allergic to penicillin, okay? One of the things you're going to find is, and you may hear some differing opinions, but ultimately I'll say my opinion is probably the rightest. <laughs> at least based on the studies that I've seen, based on the research I've done, right? So what you're going to find is that typically there's a very low chance you actually have a true cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins, okay? Because, again, they don't respond. They're not having a reaction to the beta-lactam ring. They're oftentimes having a reaction to the side chains here. And the side chains for a cephalosporin looks a whole different, uh, a lot different than you will see for a penicillin, Okay. So if I have a patient who says, I have a true blue anaphylaxis allergy to penicillin, for the most part, you're still pretty okay to give them a, a, a cephalosporin, okay? Some people will say that's, you cannot do that. That's dangerous. But again, this is one of those things where I'll have a lot of old school docs will be working in the PZR and I'll say, just give them a test dose. Just see, see how they do. Give them a test dose, the kid does fine, right? Now again, can I say that's gonna happen in every single case? No, I don't have a crystal ball. However, um, the evidence shows that there's a very low chance you're gonna have a cross reactivity. So you question like, well, where did this come from in the first place? I will tell you. Um, that back in the day, we did not have synthetic means of producing these drugs here. We actually had, and remember where, where penicillin comes from? It comes from mold, right? Mold wants to be able to grow unchecked, so it releases penicillin in order to stave off the growth of bacteria around it, right? It's a natural defense mechanism. So how do we actually produce a lot of these, these uh, drugs in the first place? Well, we had to go back and use the actual mold to do it ourselves. So very frequently what we would find is that you would have, uh, it's kind of a Reese's peanut butter sort of uh, uh, analogy here where you'd have these bacteria that would be producing penicillin, but then they also produce a little bit of cephalosporin, right? So you get the peanut butter and my, my chocolate and chocolate and peanut butter, no one? Okay, anyway. Um, Basically, there's, there's cross-contamination of the, these drugs, though. So that way, when you were receiving penicillin back in the day, decades ago, you'd be receiving a little bit of cephalosporin. So when you had a reaction, no one knew this, but you couldn't tell which one they were actually having a reaction to. So that's where that cross-reactivity really came from. We don't have that nowadays. Now we have synthetic means of producing these. So the chance of someone having a true allergy, uh, cross-reactivity, very, very low. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, going forward. But just so you know, very low chance we're going to have a real true cross reactivity. And that's only for the patients who have an actual anaphylaxis allergy to penicillin. So they say, I had a little bit of rash. They're probably not, they're totally fine. They're not going to have any issues with that. Okay, makes sense? We'll talk more about allergies as we go forward. But that's a big thing because, as you're going to see, there's a ton of drugs in the cephalosporin category. So if every patient came in and said, well, I'm allergic to penicillin, and said, okay, well, that's like two dozen drugs I can't give you now for life potentially. That's no good, right? You want to be able to keep your options open to you. Well, here, here's the catch. Because, I, mean, I, I work in urgent care. Just, like, when patients came in and they said, like, you know, allergic to penicillin and the PA decides, you know, well, let's give you cephalosporin, whatever, it comes to the conclusion. And now that patient has a reaction. Mm -hmm. Are you under the gun in terms of lawsuit? After that, it's kind of, you know, 
So it depends, right? So uh, as most things in medicine comes down to, it depends, right? So you want to ask, okay, what is the reaction they actually have, right? So say, okay, I had a true anaphylactic allergy to penicillin, okay? Well, what you could say is, well, I've done the research. I've looked, and I encourage you to all look up this uh, stuff yourself, right? So don't just take my word for it. Like actually look up, look up the stuff. You think I'm full of, of BS, which totally may be the case. I could be feeding you totally wrong information this whole time. <laughs> I'm telling you I'm not. But uh, I know a very wise man told me one time, he says, you know, only believe half of what you see and nothing of what you hear. So trust, but verify, right? So anyway, so you can look this stuff up. But if you said, hey, I've done the research, I've looked at the review articles that says, hey, if they have, and again, this is what the review article will say, is that they have a true anaphylaxis allergy to penicillin, the chance of them having a cross reactivity is less than 1%. So if acephalosporin is a really good drug for them, and I have a 100% chance or very high chance that this is going to treat their infection versus a less than 1% chance of them having a reaction, is that worth it? Well, you have to make that call, right? You have to balance the, the risk versus the benefits. Very frequently, I say, I think it is worth the risk, especially if you can do it in a monitored setting. So if we're in the ER, where that's the best care you can get for an anaphylactic uh, reaction, I say, go ahead and give them a test dose and see how they do. If they fly, you can give them two hours, they, they have no problems, then they're good to go. Now, you can at least note on their chart that say, hey, this patient can now receive cephalosporins. I know they're not gonna have a reaction, there you go. If they have a reaction, you can at least say, well, I have the medical literature to back me up to say, like, this is a very low probability. I know that this was a chance, but I think that it was still worth the risk, right? Because you, you, at that point, you know, you can give anyone a drug, you have an adverse reaction, and it's not like you're, they're going to sue you for it necessarily, right? But you did your due diligence, you did the research, you know, at least um, you have the evidence to back you up. You said that uh, uh, years ago that cephalosporins were also made with penicillin, and you could have a reaction with either. So it would be safer to give like a pediatric patient who has a penicillin allergy to cephalosporin instead of like an elderly patient who may actually have the allergy to cephalosporin? Um, I, you know, and honestly, I don't even know the time frame when that was actually happening. So, I mean, it was long enough ago to where maybe that's theoretically safer. It, it probably doesn't matter, to be honest. Like, it probably um, it is very unlikely that they, uh, those number of patients you're going to run into that actually fit in that situation are probably pretty rare, I would imagine. Uh, most of them are probably dying off at this point, uh, I would guess. But I did, people die. I was just, that's how it is, right? I'm not trying to be callous by any means. But um, anyway, yeah, so I, I don't know that it would be that too terribly big of a risk at that point. Yeah. Because the problem is, like, people leave stuff on the chart, right? So they'll, they'll leave uh, allergies on the chart for, for decades, uh, as the case may be. And you're like, well, I know they can receive this drug. Can you just take it off their, their profile, uh, off the allergy list? And they're like, nah, I kind of want to do that. Because what if? What if they have a reaction to something else down the road? Um, and so it's really not a good prudent care for your patients, right? So again, if they don't have a true allergy, just take off their profile. You want to have it on there. Because otherwise, it's always going to be a question every time you want to give them a drug out of that category, right? OK, so enough. enough uh, I'll get off my soapbox about allergies. Anyway, we'll talk about sulfas later on. That's a whole other ball of wax. Anyway, so um, with cephalosporins, some of their claims to fame, and we're going to find that you can categorize the cephalosporins into several different generations, right? Uh, so one nice thing about them, they have good cerebral spinal fluid penetration. They have an easy time getting across the blood-brain barrier, which means it's good for what type of infection? Meningitis, Meningitis right? So you're going to very frequently see that a cephalosporin is going to be a go-to drug for meningitis. We'll talk about the specific ones in a little bit here. And again, very low chance for a true cross-reactivity. If you have someone who had a really true IgE-mediated anaphylactic allergy to penicillin, less than 1%, as, uh, as you'll see. Um, side effects tend to be very similar to the penicillin, right? So the monitoring is going to be the same. Obviously, monitoring for adverse reactions, such as anaphylaxis. Um, you're going to see some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Pretty normal stuff, right? Nothing out of the ordinary there. Now, we'll talk about the spectrum of activity, and that's going to be via generation, right? So we're going to say that, okay, the first generation has this kind of activity, second, third, and fourth. Now there's even a fifth we'll talk about briefly. Um, I'll show you a graph that kind of will demonstrate that in a little bit. Other things we're going to point out as we go forward, we're going to see that uh, as far as anti-pseudomonal activity, so again, that's another thing you want to be aware of, right? Um, ceftazidime, cefepime, and then two of the new ones we have are ceftaroline and ceftolazine. Now, it's, you know, the penicillins, you can definitely tell a penicillin by looking at the name. So if it says psyllin in it, you probably know it's a penicillin, right? Uh, if it has a ceph on the front, C-E-F, then you probably know it's a cephalosporin, okay? Now, I wish there was a really nice naming category for the different generations. There's not. It took me forever to try to memorize that stuff, too, just like it will take a while for you to get uh, get it down. Um, but you'll know or after a while, you'll say, okay, I know this is my good go-to first-generation drug. I know this is my go-to second, third, fourth, and fifth, and so on, right? Now, um, as far as elimination goes, these are also going to be renally eliminated. There's one notable exception, which I'll show you in a few minutes, um, but otherwise you need to watch for renal function. You need to make sure you're adjusting for that, okay?
So in general, as you're going to be moving up the generations of cephalosporins here, you're going to see that as uh, you go forward, you're going to notice you're going to have increasing amounts of gram-negative coverage. It starts out pretty poor with the first generations. I mean, it's okay, but you're going to find that it's going to get better and better and better as you go for the, the fourth generations. You're going to find that gram-positive coverage stays pretty good as your first generation, but it's going to start to drop down until you get back up to the fourth generation. Okay, This is going to start to peak back up a little bit. And actually, this is where we're going to see the introduction of one of our first drugs that actually covers MRSA. Okay, So a little sneak peek into the few slides in the future. Right. Um, but anyway, we'll get into the specifics and you see this kind of bore out. Um, but just uh, kind of reference back to this table or this graph will give you a good idea. So the first generation cephalosporins, this is a good workhorse kind of uh, uh, generation of cephalosporin. You're going to find this gets used as frequently or more so than things like amoxicillin does, right? <laughs> so a really good uh, set of drugs. No anaerobic coverage. And in general, you're not going to find much anaerobic coverage with the cephalosporins. It's just one of the, the holes in its coverage. It's really not going to do much for it, right? Um, with the first generation, not a ton of gram negative coverage. You may have a little bit of, you know, things like some E. coli. You're not going to use, you know, Keflex a lot for things like, you know, UTIs. You can occasionally, but it doesn't have great gram negative coverage, but pretty good for gram positive. Okay. Uh, this does include things like uh, MSSA coverage, right? So this is why this is good for things like uh, coverage of surgical prophylaxis, right? Because whenever I cut into a patient for surgery, I could be introducing those skin bugs into whatever wound I'm making, right? Uh, so because of that, you need to give the patient uh, what we call surgical prophylaxis or an amount of antibiotics that will cover them for a period of time to make sure they don't get an infection, right? So typically what you do is you would, if you have a patient going to surgery, say they're having, um, you know, lap coli or something like that, you're going to give them usually uh, about an hour or at least within an hour of the actual incision time, give them a dose of ANCEF or this uh, drug called Cefazolin here, you may see cefazolin, I just call it cefazolin, doesn't really matter. Um, but ANCEF is the brain, it's everyone just calls it ANCEF. Um, but this is going to be really good because you can actually give it uh, within an hour of that incision time, and then you give them 24 hours worth of coverage. And so this one you give every eight hours. So typically as the post-op orders come through, you give them two doses, Q8 hours apart, and then that way they get 24 hours of coverage, and then you're pretty well assured they should not get an infection after that. Now is that 100% guaranteed they won't get infected? No, right. So you do need to do like you know good wound dress changes and cleaning and all that kind of thing, but it should prevent most infections from occurring. So very good for surgical prophylaxis. This, uh, ANCEF is typically given IV only, so this is where you're going to see that being used very frequently in the hospital. Good for MSSA covers, I mentioned, and then occasionally it's used for UTIs. Now, if it's a much more complicated UTI, if it turns into like pyelonephritis or something like that, this is not going to be good. But a good kind of just <coughs> normal run-of-the-mill UTI with no you know chronic conditions, no uh, past medical history, it's fine, right? Um, Keflex or cephalaxin, I'm sure most people have heard of Keflex before, right? So uh, many of you may have taken it at some point. Um, but this is a good one that's good for oral use. Okay, so, you know, when you think about things like free drug list, you know, uh, oftentimes Keflex is on there, amoxicillin uh, is probably on there too in a lot of cases, but this is good for skin and soft tissue infections, so maybe some cellulitis, um, you know, UTIs can be used as well. Uh, now, keep in mind that this is where things like antibiograms can be very useful, right? So if you have a patient you strongly suspect to have, say, MSSA, and you look at your antibiogram, you see that, you know, Keflex is only, say, 65% sensitive to those isolates, is this a good choice? Probably not, right? You probably want something in the 80s or 90s, right? So I may go with a different drug based on the sensitivities, but it all depends on where you work and what kind of environment, what type of patient you're dealing with, et cetera, right? So these are things where antibiograms can be very useful for helping to delineate that. Um, one other thing to note here as far as coverage goes, uh, the cephalosporins as a class do not cover enterococcus, okay? So if you ever have an enterococcus infection, cephalosporins are not going to do it for you, okay? As I mentioned, some gram negative coverage. Usually your run-of-the-mill UTI stuff, though, E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, but not uh, once it starts to get more resistant gram negatives, you're not really going to get much coverage here. Okay. Okay, second generations. Here's how we have a few here. So you're going to find this gets a little bit more anaerobic coverage. Oh, yes, sir. You said that <clears throat> with the first generation cephalosporins, they do cover, for the gram negatives, they do cover the E. coli and proteins. Proteins. Yeah, but usually like the more the, the wimpy version, right? So if you have like someone who comes in, you know, no past medical history and they come in the UTI, like that'll probably cover it. But if they have history of like, you know, recent antibiotic use or recurrent UTIs, they probably have nastier bugs that are not going to really respond well to that that ANSEF for that Keflex, right? So those are good things you want to consider and be like, well, I probably don't want to start off with this week of a gun. Maybe I can build up to something else. So it's more likely to get those resistant bugs. That makes sense. Anyway, uh, so as far as second generations go, you're going to see here that uh, has pretty good gram-negative coverage, pretty good gram-positive coverage, and, and a little bit of anaerobes here. Um, so here you have things like cefatitan, you have cefoxetin, 
you know, cefuroxine, which has a PO and an IV version, and then you also have cefprazil, uh, or that which is a PO. And again, I'm not going to ask you specifically, is this IV or PO? Like, I'm not going to have you memorize that, but I want you to at least start to see these, so you start to have an idea of like, okay, well, how do these drugs actually come? Okay. And again, more gram negative coverage than your first generation agent. So now you start to include things like H flu, Neisseria. Um, you still have things like Proteus and E. coli being covered here. Um, in a lot of cases, you can use this for things like um, urinary tract infection, upper respiratory tract infections, and then in sometimes we see, see it being used for surgical prophylaxis. But um, generally, ANSAF is pretty much king for, for that realm of things. Okay. This is probably the one I see the least amount of use of, at least from the hospital sort of standpoint. I see a lot of first generations, a lot of third, a lot of fourth, okay? Now, the third generation ones here, you only have a few that fall into this category. And so um, we're going to have ceftriaxone or rocephin. Who's heard of rocephin before? Okay, most people heard of rocephin before. Sometimes if you have too good of a time, like at a, a spring break or something, you need a shot of rocephin. Just depends. Um, it kind of goes in that, that's, uh, that, you know, penicillin being really good for syphilis. This is really good for, for things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, as you'll see. But anyway, um, <coughs> I mean, I like a good staycation for spring break, but that was just me. It didn't really have any issues. But um, so uh, again, ceftriaxone, very good IV agent. This gets used, this is a good workhorse sort of antibiotic, especially for patients who are gonna come inpatient, used very, very frequently. The benefit with this drug is that there is no renal dose adjustment. So this is one notable exception to all the other cephalosporins that do have renal dose adjustments. This one does not because it gets primarily metabolized in the liver. It's a good thing, right? So again, if you have someone who's coming in, they're septic, their kidneys are taking hit, you don't have to worry about that. I can get ceftriaxone, the normal dosing, no problem whatsoever, which is good. It has a good, really good strep coverage. So for a lot of ENT stuff, if you see patients are failing normal therapy, so if you have someone who say has, um, you know, uh, bacterial sinusitis and they fail augmentin and they're coming into the hospital, uh, ceftriaxone is gonna be able to get that strep pneumo, right? It's good coverage against that. Um, the one thing to note is, and this is a pediatric concern, specific in neonates, uh, and I, I think I've mentioned this example before, but you cannot use this in the first 30 days of life. Anyone remember that example, why that was? This goes to protein binding. So if you remember, <coughs> Neonates, that first month of life, they have a lot of bilirubin, and so that binds up to albumin. If I give ceftriaxone, that will kick off the bilirubin and cause jaundice in those children. So you don't want to do that. So for the first 30 days of life, you cannot use the third generation cephalosporin, specifically ceftriaxone. As an alternative, say we have a kid who has neonatal sepsis, this is where we're going to need something like cefotaxime. This is the preferred agent, does not have that same protein binding interaction. Okay. So for a neonate, the first 30 days of life, you can use cefotaxime. Everyone else can use ceftriaxone. Yes, sir. So like for I don't know. I guess that it would depend on because obviously you have more proteins than uh, neonate would. So uh, I don't know specific. That could be a, a thing. I have not run into that too frequently. Uh, but maybe you want to do some extra research and see if that would be a problem. Maybe. Uh, they said like steel burst syndrome or whatever. Okay. Sure. So I was just wondering if that's a consideration for I don't know. I haven't worked with too many patients uh, with that particular issue, so that'd be something interesting to look up, though. Maybe a good research project uh, in upcoming semesters. Keep that in your back pocket, right? There you go. <laughs> Anywho, um, another good one here we have called ceftazidine. This one actually has a little bit of pseudomonas coverage, but does not get used for that very frequently. The reason for that is, is that you develop a lot of resistance. Pseudomonas tends to become resistant to ceftazidine very quickly, so it doesn't get used too frequently for that. We use this a lot for like our CF kids who have specific bugs that are uh, typically susceptible to ceftazidine, but we don't use this frequently for many other patients. The other notable thing here is going to be septinir and then cefixime. These are good PO agents. So if I need to send a patient out, I'm worried they have, a, uh, say, a resistant UTI, but I think septinir is going to be able to cover it. Um, that's a good oral agent. You can send a patient home once. We use a lot of uh, septinir uh, for you know outpatient use with our uh, ER patients. So again, even better gram-negative coverage in your second generation. You lose more gram-positive, so uh, you probably won't see this used a ton for like skin and soft tissue infections, like you might for like a first generation. Um, but good for things like you know uh, respiratory tract infections. You know, UTIs, things like that, right? And some extra coverage against like serratia, marxala, which you do see a lot of marxala with, um, you know, a lot of respiratory infections and whatnot. Okay, and again, I mentioned you know, ceftriaxone. Now, the one thing to note here, we mentioned that the cephalosporins, are they time dependent or concentration dependent? 
these are also going to be time dependent, just like the um, uh, just like the penicillins were. The uh, one thing you'll note with Rosefin, though, and that uh, and the one way I remember this uh, is that ceftriaxone one, ceftriaxone. You see that one on the end of there. You only have to give it one time a day. It actually has a really long half life. So in addition to the benefit of it not needing renal dose adjustment, I only need to give it one time a day. For some more severe infections like meningitis, you may see it used twice a day. But the nice thing with, uh, with uh, Rocephin, I can give them a dose in the ER, and they don't have to worry about getting another dose till the next day, right? So especially if they're getting mended, there's maybe some delays and all that. Um, they only need it one time a day, so that's a good, a good benefit there. Good thing to remember. And then I mentioned ceftazidime. Um, again, not used very frequently due to resistance issues that, that pop up. Okay, uh, another very good sort of, uh, a little bit more specific sort of use case, uh, sort of antibiotic is gonna be cefepime. This is our fourth generation cephalosporin. Um, this is another broad spectrum sort of antibiotic. So when you think about um, broad spectrum pseudomonas covering uh, beta-lactams, you kind of think of piperacillin, tazobactam, or zosin, kind of in the same vein as uh, cefepime here. The big difference with those two is that zosin has anaerobic coverage, good for gut infections. Cefepime does not have uh, anaerobic coverage so no, not good for like, uh, you know, gut stuff, you know, bite wounds, things like that, right? So good gram negative coverage, good pseudomonal coverage, good gram positives, but does not cover enterococcus because we said no cephalosporin covers that and then no MRSA coverage, right? So we're still missing MRSA. Uh, and again, no anaerobic activity, but this is really good for patients who have um, no succomial infections. So we use this very frequently for uh, ventilator associated pneumonias or hospital acquired pneumonias. We also use it for things like neutropenic fever. Now, anyone know who gets neutropenic fever? Hmm? Yeah, so if they're immunocompromised or they have a suppressed immune system. So very frequently we have cancer patients, right? So people are on chemotherapy, they tend to be neutropenic. So they, again, oftentimes the only signs of infection they may have are going to be fever, okay? Um, patients with, you know, HIV slash AIDS, you know, they can develop this as well. So this gets very frequently used for patients who have, um, you know, depressed immune systems who may not be able to fight off normal bugs like a normal healthy person with a, a reconstituted immune system could really do. So because of that, this is a good first line agent. Again, it's a very broad spectrum. You don't want to leave them on this if you don't have to, but once you get those cultures back, then you can start to downscale therapy and get a little bit more specific about what you're going to use. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I didn't mention before, when do you want to get cultures in regards to when you give the antibiotic? Does anyone know? You know? You have to do it before. Okay, what's the problem if I do it after? <laughs> The back, yeah, the antibiotic can kill off the bacteria, right? So again, I can pull a culture after they've already received antibiotics, but the problem is I could have killed off the causative bacteria, or maybe I've inhibited them enough they won't grow on that plate. So because of that, you need to draw cultures before you give the antibiotic whenever possible, right? Now, if someone is like on the verge of coding and they have meningitis, like, yeah, give them the freaking antibiotic, they need it, right? Um, the culture is maybe a secondary concern in those cases, but if possible, always get a culture beforehand, okay? Mm -hmm. So again, Get a, you know, if you need to get a, a cath in them, get a urine sample. If you need to get a blood cultures, whatever you need, get it from them first before antibiotics, okay? Otherwise, you're going to skew your results. And that way, when they culture nothing back, you can't say, well, do they really have, is this really not a bacterial issue? Is it viral? Is it fungal? Is it something else? Or, or is it because I gave the antibiotics? So again, with you, especially if you're coming up on a patient who's maybe been in the hospital for a couple of days or so, you need to look back at that timing, you right? You need to look back and say, well, when was this culture drawn versus when were antibiotics started? Because you may be able to discover, okay, well, this actually makes sense because they got the antibiotics first. So that's why we're not culturing anything, okay? Kind of makes sense? Anyway, so one thing to consider there. Now, some of the new ones we have here, um, and again, I don't see these used too, too frequently because, again, they're pretty new, and when drugs are very new, they're also very expensive yeah they cost a lot so again you don't see these added to formulary unless there's like a really specific use case for it but this new one's called ceftaroline or teflaro or teflaro i'm not sure how you pronounce that but one of the two um again good gram negative coverage good gram positive but still no enterococcus again that's just a cephalosporin hole that uh and covers it will not be, ever be able to fill the notable thing here is it does have mrsa coverage also has anti-pseudomonal coverage. So it's kind of a unique one that actually covers both of these. It's very rare that you see that a drug covers MRSA and pseudomonas. So it's kind of a unique thing there. But again, no anaerobic activity. And what the uh, drug companies approved, got approved for from the FDA was actually for community-acquired pneumonia, which kind of makes sense. Once we get to the palm, we'll look at the bugs that are most likely to cause uh, pneumonias. That'll make sense there. And then also skin and soft tissue infections, primarily not due to the pseudomonas, right? <coughs> not the pseudomonas can't cause skin infections, but it's less likely, but more likely than not, it's going to be something like MRI, yeah, staff, right? So MRSA, MSSA, staff, FB, all the things are going to be covered by this, which is great, okay? And again, must be renally dose adjusted. Ceftriaxone is really the only one you don't have to do that with, okay?
And then one other new one is going to be septolazine plus tazobactam. This is actually the first drug that at least I'm aware of that has a cephalosporin plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Usually you've only ever seen uh, penicillins mix the, uh, mixing those two together, but this one's called Zerbaxa. And again, has pretty good gram-negative coverage, good gram-positive. Does not cover MRSA or enterococcus, right? Not like the uh, ceftarolene did, um, but it does have good anti-pseudomonal coverage, okay? And it has a little bit of anaerobic coverage, probably due to the fact that we added in that beta-lactamase inhibitor, as we saw with the, the uh, penicillins before. Um, again, good for complicated intra-abdominal infections, right? Because uh, again, we're thinking gram-negatives, thinking anaerobes. We'll talk about a drug called metronidazole a little bit later, but this is also a really good gram-negative cover, uh, uh, anaerobic coverage. And then also good for complicated urinary tract infections, okay? So again, uh, as far as testing goes, because these are the two newest ones, the ceftolazine and the ceftaroline, I will probably be less likely to ask questions on those than I am the really the workhorse ones I kind of mentioned, like your first generations, your third generations, your fourth generation. Those are probably the ones I spend a little bit more time as far as uh, investing mental real estate to. Not to say this can come up on the test, but I'm just saying that I'd probably spend a little bit more time thinking about the other ones because you do, you're do you going to see them day in and day out when you're working, say, in the hospital or if you're prescribing antibiotics for an outpatient purpose. Okay, make sense? Again, I hear way more typing whenever I say if something's going to be on the test or not on the test. I find that a little odd, but whatever. Um, next up, we have our monobactam. Again, this is uh, there's only one drug in this category called as trianam. Uh, notice here it still has that beta-lactam ring. The claim to fame for for a long time was that it had no cross-reactivity to penicillin allergies. So if you had someone, and again, this is back in the day when we thought less about um, the fact that there's less than 1% cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins. So this one got some use out of that. The problem with it is it has a very narrow spectrum of coverage, really only covers gram negatives, no gram positive coverage, no aerobic coverage, or anaerobic coverage, I should say. Um, and actually, it looks a lot like coverage that we'll see with the aminoglycosides. We'll talk about these a little bit later on. Um, but kind of think back to those is it only has gram negative coverage, so kind of limited in scope to that degree. But good activity against pseudomonas so that could be one thing you could use it for potentially. Okay. Um, again, also renally dosed, just like the penicillins, just like the cephalosporins. Um, and again, monitoring is going to be very the same here. Uh, and again, if you have some of the true penicillin allergy, if you're really, really concerned about giving them a cephalosporin, this is an okay one to give. They've shown no cross reactivity between uh, astreanium and any of the penicillins, uh, allergic patients. Okay, next up, this is the last category I think of beta lactams we're going to talk about. These are the carbapenems. So if you ever hear the term gorilla psyllin, this is what we're talking about. These are, these are kind of like, uh, if I like go to the gym and you see like, you know, kind of like a little wimpy guy like lifting weights, like that's probably like penicillin. If you see like the big bodybuilders, this is the carbapenems. Like these are the big guns here. Um, so we're gonna have things like imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem, and then doripenem. So if you see penem on there, you know it's a carbapenem basically. So again, but the picture of a nuclear blast because this will wipe out nearly everything on a patient as from, from a uh, bac bacteria standpoint. Um, now, very good coverage against gram positives. No MRSA coverage, though, so that's a notable hole in coverage there, right? Uh, very good gram negative coverage. <laughs> Uh, covers pseudomonas, except for ertapenem. Ertapenem is kind of the weakest one of the bunch here, but like meropenem, which uh, every hospital I've worked at so far, merum has been uh, the go-to drug uh, as far as what's been on formulary. Um, but imipenem works here as well. Doripenem all has good pseudomonas coverage. We'll cover anaerobes. So this is good for gut infections too, if you were to be considered uh, considering that. The nice thing here is that even if you have really resistant bugs, like say you have pseudomonas, that you give, give a penicillin and it laughs at it, it says, get that pepperacillin out of here. This doesn't work on me. You could give them meropenem, it'll probably kill it, right? So this stuff is very, very good uh, for uh, coverage here. So this is good for multi-drug resistant gram-negative infections, right? So if you had something where patients have been on antibiotics previously and they're still resistant to that, this is where you can step it up to the carbapenems, right? Um, now, this is also going to be good against bacteria that are producing those extended spectrum beta lactamases, right? So these are things where um, even if you give it something like uh, clavulonic acid or sulbactam, it can still cleave those, right? So the, the bacteria are just that much more resistant. Carbapenems can still overcome that, right? So again, they're very good for resistant uh, bugs here. Uh, good for nosocomial infections and very good for meningitis, okay? Now, as a provider, it's very easy to make that knee-jerk reaction and say, well, if this kills everything, I'm going to give it to all my patients, right? Because there's guaranteed to kill something they got, right? Not appropriate, right? You want to make sure that you're using as narrow a spectrum of drug as possible. Very frequently, these are going to be, uh, you know, nowadays a lot of hospitals are doing what we call antimicrobial stewardship. 
that basically means that we need to be good stewards about when we use these antibiotics and who we use them on. So because of that, we oftentimes will restrict the use of things like uh, the carbapenems only for the sickest patients or those that really do require it. And very frequently, we need things like, you know, um, you know we'll have like a provider who wants to use meropenem for a patient, and it'll ask them very specifically in the EMR, it says, hey, do you have approval from an ID specialist? Okay. And they'll say, yes, I got approval from Dr. So-and-so. And we get the order and we say, okay, well, I'm going to call them just to make sure. Because again, we get in trouble if we don't do that. So we call them, they say, oh, I didn't say that. They can't get that antibiotic. And they don't get it, right? <laughs> so again, they have a lot of control there. But that's important because once we lose the use of things like carbapenems, there's probably not a lot out there that's going to treat these infections, okay? So again, very, very important. If you see something that's resistant to a carbapenem, it's a pretty nasty bug. Are pharmacists able to oversee like doctors' choices of choosing these like carbapenems and upholding that stewardship? Like, um, we do play a big role with that, right? So some of it's going to be kind of more globally where you look at things like trends of antibiotic use within the hospital. Sometimes it does come down to the individual order where basically, you know, if a doc says, I really want meropenem, and it says you need to have ID approval, and ID does not approve it, we can deny that order. So you need to choose something else, okay? Oftentimes what's more likely to happen, and this is a very good example of kind of good interdisciplinary, interprofessional care, is that we will call them and be like, hey, you know, I noticed you you want to use meropenem. However, looking at previous cultures, looking at X, Y, and Z, these different factors, I think this may be a better antibiotic. That leads to a good discussion where you can try to come to a middle ground and say, okay, well, let's try this first. Patient doesn't prove in 48 hours, then you can think about stepping up to meropenem, right? Uh, or wait till the cultures come back and see what those show, et cetera, right? Um, so again, you don't want to get into like an adversary sort of match where like I'm not going to give you this antibiotic right like sometimes a patient does really need it but you need to go through the proper channels to make sure you're using them appropriately and being good stewards of those because again once you lose your antibiotics you got nothing right anyway so good coverage for pretty much everything all right, so again, just kind of giving you some examples and showing you how these are dosed. Again, these are time-dependent killers. They need to be above the MIC. These are also going to be renally dose addresses, so you need to make sure you're monitoring for that. Make sure you need, if you need to give it Q12, give it Q12, and you give it Q24, whatever the case may be, okay? Um, one other unique thing, and again, this is important when I'm pointing out things that I say, this is unique to this drug, those are probably good things to note, right? Because again, this is something that will differentiate it from all the other ones within a group. In this case, seizures can be seen with the drug imipenem. Okay, so if you have a patient with a seizure disorder, this might not be the best drug for them. This is especially true when they have renal dysfunction and they're not going to be clearing it very well. So, for instance, if I have a patient comes in, say with sepsis, and I started them on imipenem for their infection. And then I don't monitor the renal function, I don't see that it's deteriorating, and I don't adjust the imipenem, and then it develops seizures, that's no good, right? That's on me because I wasn't actually being uh, more, more proactive to make sure to monitor for that and adjusting as appropriate, okay? So again, that's a unique thing you're going to see with imipenem, you don't see with the other ones, which is probably why in most hospitals, meropenem tends to be the formulary item uh, because, again, you don't have to worry about it with that one, so why, why, why use uh, an inferior drug? So, you know, uh, but who knows? Maybe there's a shortage, maybe you have to use it, who could say? Okay, um, next up, we have vancomycin. This is another good workhorse IV antibiotic you're gonna be using. You know, if you work in the hospital, you're probably gonna be using it quite a bit, uh, kind of which uh, area you're working in. But this is uh, a not a beta-lactam drug. I think if you go back to that picture, imagine how big that molecule is. We'll talk about that, it'll be important in a second. But um, this is not a beta-lactam antibiotic. It is still working to inhibit cell wall synthesis. So it's still a cell wall active agent. So again, if you think it's bactericidal or static, you would th think bactericidal, perfect. Um, because again, it's deteriorating that wall, right? It's, it's decreasing the, the integrity of that wall. Basically what uh, vancomycin is gonna be doing, and vancomycin is gonna be this kind of gray molecule coming in here, um, which you're gonna find is gonna be able to come in and actually prevent the cross-linking from happening. Now notice this is independent of penicillin binding protein. So even if a bacteria were to develop, say a new version of penicillin binding protein that maybe prevented, say for instance, um, uh, something like you know dicloxacillin from binding to it, Vancomycin doesn't care. Vancomycin can still work because it doesn't need that. Uh, it doesn't need to interact with penicillin binding protein. Okay. Now it's not to say that you can't become resistant to vancomycin. You absolutely can. Uh, but that is again another sign that you have a pretty nasty bug that you're dealing with. So we're talking about a few backup drugs that you can use in case vancomycin is not going to work. But if you have a pretty significant uh, vancom or a pretty significant uh, uh, bug that you're worried about that's going to be gram positive, vancomycin is probably going to get it most uh, most cases of the time. So anyway, um, its coverage is only gram positive. So this is all it does. So if you have something like an abscess or skin infection, vancomycin is probably gonna cover it, right? Unless there's something weird about it and there may be a gram negative in there. But very frequently, you're gonna find that vancomycin does not get used on its own. 
unless you have a really good indication to use it on its own. So for instance, if I have someone who comes in, say, for sepsis, right? If I don't know what the bug is, I don't know if it's MRSA, I don't know if it's pseudomonas, I have no idea, right? I just know that they're septic. Um, until I get those cultures back, I kind of have to go with the worst case scenario. So very frequently, you're going to see vancomycin being used as part of impure coverage for these really sick patients. These are usually like ICU patients you're running into. And so you use vancomycin for all the gram positive coverage, and then you usually use something else to cover for the gram negatives and maybe atypicals or whatever else you might think is, is involved here. But vancomycin is a good cornerstone of that therapy. Now, again, this is not double coverage because I'm not using two antibiotics for the same bug. This is just making sure that I can cover the gram positives and I got something to cover the gram negatives, okay? So if you ever see like vancomycin plus zosin, that makes total sense because we know vancomycin is good for gram positives. Zosin is really good for gram negatives, anaerobes, and all of that, okay? Zosin just can't really cover the same sort of uh, gram positives that vancomycin can, okay? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it's a very good, um, it's IV, uh, typically IV only. I'll tell you about one exception where it's going to be used for PO use. Um, but for penallergic patients, especially for cases where they're undergoing surgery and you're needing to cover for those skin bugs, uh, they really can't receive a penicillin or a cephalosporin. Vancomycin is typically used as an alternative there, okay? This is great for MRSA. So if you suspect a patient's MRSA, vancomycin is going to get it for the most part. Um, when you ever you see VRSA or Versa, that's vancomycin-resistant staph aureus. That is much rarer to see. However, when you see it, it's a bad sign, right? And again, we're seeing higher and higher numbers of it popping up. It's not as big of a problem as you see with a lot of those nasty gram-negative rods, but it's still an issue, right? So you still want to be careful of that. Now, when I say C. diff, this is actually a drug. And again, this is something that's unique that you probably want to keep your ears up about. This is a drug that you can use for C. diff, okay? However, notice the route that we're going to give it, PO. Now, vancomycin, if you go back and look at that molecule, what do you notice about the size of it? It looks like a pretty big molecule. It has a really tough time getting across a lot of biologic membranes. So for instance, this may not be a great drug to use for things like meningitis because it's a hard time getting across, especially if you have, uh, maybe you can get across once those meninges are really inflamed, but it normally has a tough time, right? Um, the other thing you're gonna find is that it cannot cross the GI tract, okay? Which means that if I give IV, because again, with a C. diff, where's the infection at? It's usually in the colon, right? So again, I need something to get, if I give something IV, I need to get, for it to get out into the colon to kill that bacteria. Otherwise, I can give it orally in order to get it directly, right? So basically attacking it from, from right from the GI tract. So vancomycin, you cannot use IV to treat C. diff because it's not going to be able to cross into the GI tract. However, I can use it orally. And what's nice about this here is that actually you don't see any translocation of it to the systemic circulation. So I can give someone oral vancomycin, I can do blood levels, and I never see a level uh, actually be, ever become detectable, right? Because it just can't be absorbed. Now, interestingly enough, if you look up uh, vancomycin absorption, in the case of C. diff colitis, you may see an article by someone you might know, um, where actually we actually had a really sick uh, pediatric kid, uh, this PICU kiddo who had, um, I believe she had some sort of leukemia, but she was severely immunocompromised. She ended up developing C. diff because she was on every antibiotic known to man, every antifungal known to man. Um, and she ended up developing this really severe colitis. And so we were giving her oral vancomycin. She also had really bad kidneys to go along with all that. Uh, this is, I mean, this kid was sicker than, than it's not. Um, but we were able to, um, you know, someone had the bright idea, well, this kid's kidney function is really bad. And again, we'll show you the vancomycin specifically eliminating the kidneys. There's like, man, this kid's colon is so inflamed. There's probably a lot of gaps that are forming there that are probably allowing them to absorb the vancomycin. Sure enough, she was getting therapeutic vancomycin levels, IV, by measuring from the bloodstream, uh, uh, just through oral use. Very strange sort of thing. So sometimes you see exceptions to this, but vancomycin is uh, usually pretty good about not being absorbed at all. So again, just a little kind of unique thing you might see out there with random patients. But um, this is also good for things like endocarditis, osteomyelitis. Again, these are typically gram-positive related infections, MRSA specifically. And then, as I mentioned, as a surgical prophylaxis, allergy, uh, for, usually for allergic patients. Yes, sir. All right, I have a question. So for CDA, PO is good because it doesn't translocate. Yeah. So it gets the bacteria that is only on the colon, correct? Mm-hmm. On the GI tract. Yes. If I were to give it IV, it would not do anything for C. diff. However, it would work for things such as Yeah, so so your question, and again, I'm just repeating this for the recording, but right, so if I have a patient with C. diff colitis, I can give them oral vancomycin, and that will treat the infection. I really shouldn't see any absorption. If I measure blood levels, I shouldn't see any vancomycin, right, for most patients. Um, if I have C. diff and I give them vancomycin IV, it's not going to be able to penetrate into the GI tract. I'm never going to be able to treat that infection, okay? However, if I have, say, something like a pneumonia due to MRSA or if I had a bloodstream infection with MRSA, vancomycin is going to get it, right, because it's going to be able to – I can give it IV and it's in those tissues, no problem, okay? That makes sense? Anyway. Um,
So this is one of the drugs that you're going to be doing therapeutic drug monitoring on, okay? Due to the toxicities and due to uh, monitoring for efficacy. So very similar to the penicillin, this is also going to be a time-dependent killer. So you need to keep this above the MIC, right? So you need to keep it above the MIC to kill off those bacteria. And so one of the things we'll do is we actually monitor for a blood level. So in the case of a time-dependent killer, do you think you care more about the peak level or the trough level? The trough, why, what, what is the trough telling me? Perfect, right, so I do not want that trough to go below the MIC, so if I'm measuring the trough, which is the lowest level I get before the next dose, that tells me if I'm above the MIC or not, right? So this is where we can shoot for things, and again, I'm not gonna ask you specific drug levels, but I'm just trying to illustrate to you, this is one of those drugs that we do do therapeutic drug monitoring on, and there's so many patients that get put on vancomycin that this becomes a very important thing, right? So, and again, most of the time, if you're in a hospital, your friendly neighborhood pharmacist are gonna take care of this for you, you can just put, vancomycin consult for pharmacy and they take care of everything for you. you don't have to think about it however you may be in a place where you have to do it yourself so this is why i want you to at least be aware of it so anyway the trough levels you know we should maybe shoot for 10 to 15. sometimes we'll go even higher if it's a more severe infection or if it's a site where it's very difficult to penetrate so if i have meningitis by getting a higher blood level i should be able to get a higher level everywhere and that includes things like uh, the meninges right if i have a higher level i should be able to penetrate the bone better if i think the osteomyelitis you know endocarditis etc um and again, this is another example where I can sometimes give a bigger dose up front and then use lower doses to maintain my levels. What do you call that? Bolus. Yeah, a bolus dose, but more specifically, because the point is to get me the steady state sooner. It's called remember the loading dose phenomenon, right? We give a big dose up front to try to get us to steady state sooner. Because if I have a patient with an infection, I want to get above that MIC as soon as I can, right? Especially if it's a really severe infection. Uh, so by giving a loading dose, I can get them up to steady state sooner with the first dose in fact and then give them a lower maintenance dose in order to keep them there okay anyway so again we want to keep this above the mic sometimes what we'll see is when you get a culture back for a bug it'll actually give you what the mic is and if the mic is too high that means you may not be able to use that drug right because i can give you enough vancomycin to get you above the mic but what are you more likely to see if i keep driving those levels up toxicity right and so toxicity is a big one we're going to see with uh, vancomycin uh, as being uh, kind of unique Again, just remember, steady state, how long does it take to get to steady state? Four to five half-lives, right? So again, if I have a really sick patient going to the ICU, there are multiple pressors for their blood pressure, um, they're not looking good, I can give a loading dose to try to get them up to steady state that much sooner, okay? And so again, this is the where I want to be. Now, remember, if I'm uh, not giving a loading dose, what would happen if I were to say draw a level too soon? Let's say I gave a uh, draw a trough after the first dose. Would it look too low, too high, normal? Too low, right? So again, you don't want to do it this soon. Usually we like to wait, wait before the third or fourth dose, and that's going to give us a much more representative uh, steady state level than we would see if we were to check it too early. And very frequently that will happen where uh, a provider will order vancomycin, uh, someone else comes on the next day, they go ahead and order a trough immediately, and it's too soon. They get that level and comes back and say it's like four. Say, so that's too low. Let's go ahead and give them uh, up the dose. What happens at that point? Yeah, now that can be more risk for toxicity. The levels go too high, right? So what about. And anyway, um, and again, showing you this is completely renally eliminated, and I don't expect you to memorize this table, but just know, with you have when you have more renal dysfunction, you're going to notice what, as far as the dosing goes, less and less frequently, right? So again, I can maybe for a healthy patient give it Q8, but say they have uh, renal function say 50 to 70. Now I'm giving it Q12. They even given it Q24. And then in some cases, if you have patients that have really poor kidney function, say uh, creatinine clearance less than 30, what I'll actually do is just give a one-time dose, and then I'll recheck them, say, every day. And once I get down below the trough level, that I'm uh, the therapeutic level, then I know they're getting below the MIC, now I give them another dose. That's what we call kind of pulse dose therapy, where we're just gonna give them a dose every once in a while, uh, depending on what the actual levels come back at. So that's something you may see with really poor kidney function. Okay, I'm gonna let you go on a break just in a second. I just wanna finish up vancomycin. Now, the toxicity you're worried about is gonna to be twofold. One, you're worried about nephrotoxicity, which basically means kidney damage, right? Which again, this is completely kidney eliminated. So is that a good thing? No, because you don't wanna damage your kidneys and make your kidney function even worse, right? So you don't wanna do that. So that's why you wanna monitor levels. The other big thing is gonna be ototoxicity, okay? So just like uh, Professor Q the other day was talking about uh, ototoxicity from which drug? Neomycin's a good one, what else? Amino glycosides, we'll talk about that, absolutely. Just mentioned Lasix, furosemide is another common drug you're going to see being used as a diuretic. Uh, those all can cause ototoxicity. This is another big one, right? And again, it's not uncommon for patients to be on an amino glycoside, <laughs> to be on vancomycin, to be on a diuretic like Lasix. And guess what? 
all those drugs start to add up and eventually you end up developing this hearing loss, right? If I have a patient who's sedated and intubated for a month, can they tell me if their hearing is going? Nope, they can't, right? So these are the things you have to monitor for. We have to make sure that we're monitoring their blood levels, make sure things look good, to make sure they're not going to be developing this toxicity where we can't really detect it so much. So odor toxicity, nephrotoxicity for vancomycin, be aware of it. Other big thing um, is this infusion-related reaction called red man syndrome. Now, this is something you see with vancomycin. It is not an allergy. It is something to do with how fast you're going to be administering this drug. So if you give it too fast, you end up seeing they get kind of this body-wide rash. They get uh, very flushed. They get very hot. It's very uncomfortable for the patient. All you have to do is give it slower. So this is why you see a lot of drugs being given over 30 minutes. This drug is given over two hours, at least an hour at a minimum, but two hours in some cases in order to make sure they don't have that red man syndrome. Okay. Um, Anyway, so again, requires therapy drug monitoring. We talked about that. This is when you want to get the trough, as we mentioned. Um, and again, make sure you're monitoring that renal function. Make sure you're monitoring urine output. Make sure that they're going to be clearing that drug effectively. Okay. Here's an example of what red man syndrome might look like. So you might see this, and you immediately might think, if you didn't know any better, that it looks like what? An allergic reaction. It looks like a rash. It looks like an allergic reaction. You don't want that. And actually, what's kind of interesting is that vancomycin used to be called Mississippi mud. <laughs> that gives you any kind of uh, a faith in, in medicine. This is what it used to look like back in the day, back before we had really good ways of like purifying the drug. And so it looked like you were administering mud to the patient, basically. But nowadays, you have a lot more clear um, uh, sort of variant here, so you don't really see that that, that um, given too much anymore. Um, but you will see that you still get red mans. It's still a due to being given too fast. So just, again, slow it down if you see it. It's not any reason to stop and never give them vancomycin ever again. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we continue on? Does everyone feel any, uh, any sense of overwhelming dread from the first bit so far? Fantastic. Good. Okay. That'll stick with you for a while. That's okay. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. We'll, we'll help with that. Anyway, so we're talking about the, uh, the cell wall active agents, right? So those are all your cephalosporins, those are your penicillins, those are basically all the beta-lactams, vancomycin is the other big one. Those are all bactericidal. The majority of those are all going to be uh, time-dependent killers. Now we're moving on and talking about protein synthesis inhibitors, okay? Now, again, what are some of the things that differentiate us between humans and, say, bacteria? They're small. They're small, yes. Thank you. They're very tiny. <laughs> Uh, yes, the right. Thank you. That actually gets to the right at the heart of the matter. The ribosomes are very different between us, right? And so maybe the slide gave it away. But um, the nice thing about a lot of antibiotics is that they are very specific for bacterial targets, right? So uh, when we talk about cancer drugs, you're going to find that cancerous human cells look a whole lot like normal human cells, and that we can't, our drugs can't tell the difference. And so that's why you see so much toxicity. The way we get around a lot of that with these antibiotics is the fact that they target very specific bacterial targets, right, are receptors. So in the case of things like, you know, penicillins, they're attacking the penicillin binding protein. Do we make penicillin binding protein? No, we don't. So because of that, we don't really get the same sort of toxicity. We don't get the same bactericidal effects on our cells that you'd see with bacteria. Same thing goes here for the protein synthesis inhibitors. Now, if you remember, what do the ribosomes do? Proteins. They produce proteins, right? So they're going to take all that RNA from the nucleus, and they're going to be uh, transcribing it over into, or translating, I should say, translating it over into new proteins. If you stop this process, does that kill the cell? Not necessarily. In general, you're going to find that it does not, because the cell can still operate. It just can't produce new proteins, uh, but it does have a nice bacteriostatic sort of effect. Again, there will be a few exceptions here, but in general, these tend to be bacteriostatic sort of drugs because, again, they don't kill the cell off directly, but they inhibit the growth enough such that our own healthy immune system can come in and fight off those bacteria. Okay. <laughs> So again, looking at bacterial uh, uh, ribosomes, you're going to find that, and again, I'm not going to get so specific to be like, well, does this antibiotic affect the 50S or the 30S? You don't need to know that really for clinical purposes. Just know that it's affecting the bacterial ribosomes to inhibit protein synthesis, right? So with the bacteria, they have 70S, which is uh, made up of the 50S and 30S ribosomes. In comparison to that, we have the mammalian ribosome, which are 60S and 40S. The targets are different enough to where you don't see a lot of cross-reactivity, and thus we don't get the same sort of uh, protein inhibiting effects as you would see. Now, does that mean these drugs have no toxicity? Absolutely not, right? Every drug has toxicity. Uh, just like we saw with the penicillins and cephalosporins, they all have their own problems associated with them, okay? Now, um, what you're going to find is that uh, the groups here tend to be broken down based on their activity, which ribosome they affect. Again, I just want you to know, are these protein synthesis inhibitors? Are these going to be cell wall inhibitors? That's kind of the extent that we need to know for these purposes, okay? Uh, we'll talk about some other mechanisms later on. But when you're looking at this, this, this is where we're going to get into our macrolides. Have you guys heard of macrolides already? Yeah. 
I ask because I know you have, right? So what's an example of a macrolide? Uh, zithromycin, erythromycin, chlorithromycin, those are the common ones. Clindamycin is going to be in this mix here. Chloramphenicol, which I actually don't use a lot too frequently anymore. And then also a small uh, group called streptogramins. The two big ones here are going to be the macrolides and clindamycin. For the 30S, this is going to include the aminoglycosides. Have you guys heard of these yet? We use some of these for ophthalmic and also for uh, ENT sort of uh, uh, needs. So we'll look at those a little bit later on. And this is also where we have the tetracyclines. Okay, tetracyclines are going to have some kind of unique things as far as toxicity goes. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So looking at the macrolides first, this is a very uh, popular group of antibiotics that you use very frequently. In fact, they probably get used uh, all, probably the most inappropriately out of the bunch of antibiotics, if I had to guess. If I had to say, you know, if all the antibiotics get given for viral illnesses, macrolides are probably top of the pot. So fluoroquinolone is probably close second, but macrolides, absolutely. So anyway, they're going to be blocking this transpeptidation. You cannot produce new proteins uh, unless you have bacteriostatic sort of effect here. Now, for the most part, you're going to find most of these only given PO, which is good for outpatient use. You don't see them used IV too, too often. Uh, and in fact, they're only going to be for kind of rare instances. Um, and again, it just has to do with the fact that um, there's not really a strong clinical need for an IV form all that frequently. Unless you're patient, there's absolutely no way you can get it into them via the oral route. You have to use it, but very frequently PO. So erythromycin, this actually has several different forms that are available. So this can be PO orally. It can be IV. It can be topical as well, right? So we can actually use erythromycin for a lot of like skin infections, a lot of first aid things um, you can use this for. Sometimes it'll be in ophthalmic ointments, so you can use it for eye conditions as well. Um, again, don't worry about the salts, but sometimes you'll see different salt forms, and that may denote kind of what its activity might be like, but not really important for our purposes. Other ones in, in this category are going to include chlorithromycin, which is otherwise known as biaxin, and then you're going to have azithromycin, otherwise known as zithromax, or sometimes you see it called, uh, uh, included in a package called a Z-Pack. Right, um, and so this one sometimes given IV, but great majority of it's going to be given PO. Right, so again, everyone wants a Z pack when they go in to see their provider. But again, you as good stewards of antibiotics as a PA, you're going to say, no, no way, Jose. You're going to say you have a virus. I'm not giving it to you. Unless they really have bacterial infection, then you should probably give it to them. But looking at macrolides, again, these do not have really good uh, anaerobic coverage. So I would not use them for like gut infections and things like that. But very good gram negative, very good gram positive coverage. Now this will get MSSA but it does not cover MRSA, okay? So one thing to note with that one. But it's gonna get things like strep pneumo, it's gonna get things like strep pyogenes, listeria is gonna cover, no enterococcus coverage, but this is really good for a lot of like upper respiratory tract infections, good for a lot of um, sometimes like pneumonia, things like that. These are very good coverage uh, sort of drugs here. Um, as far as gram negatives go, it's also gonna cover things like H flu, Marxella cateralis. Now, when you were looking at uh, acute otitis media, what were the three bugs that most likely caused that? Strep pneumo. Marxella cateralis, H influenza, right? So again, macrolides are going to cover that, which is why you see a lot of upper respiratory tract infections get covered with things like a ZPAC. So then, uh, based on ours, the only reason we would prescribe that if they were allergic to penicillin. So why would amoxicillin be the first? How do you decide that's the first round of treatment versus? Yeah. So um, the question is like, well, how do you decide between giving? Uh, and again, we'll have an ENT section coming up. I'll kind of talk about it briefly here. So, um, yeah, how do you make the decision amoxicillin versus azithromycin, right? For say you're treating like an acute otitis, right? Well, when it comes down to it, is when you actually look at the guidelines, they recommend amoxicillin as your first line therapy. The benefit there is, is one, there's not as much emerging resistance against it. Now you still see some resistance strep pneumo. Don't get me wrong here, um, but it's still going to have pretty good coverage against H flu, more acetyl Ralis, right? So again, it is a little bit more narrow in spectrum than you see with the macrolides. And because macrolides get overused, you see a lot of resistance to it. So if you can get away with it, and usually you can get amoxicillin pretty cheap, right? Free in a lot of uh, in some places. So by using that, it's quick, easy to give. Um, again, one of the benefits of, uh, like, say, uh, z pack is that you only have to give it over five days instead of something like maybe 10 days just due to the half-life of the drug being longer. Um, but in general, go with amoxicillin. It's a lot easier to go with, right? Um, but if they're allergic, then azithromycin may be a really good option here. So that's a very good question, though. But again, if you can never go wrong by following the guidelines and saying, okay, well, this is the first-line agent. There's no other reason why they would need a second-line agent. Let's just go with that, okay? Because again, if you can, you can always defend your case, especially like when you're uh, on rotations and you're, you're you know, preceptors, like, why'd you choose to do that? I said, well, Sanford guy said this was first line. And they said, okay, I can't fight that, right? They may still try to fight you on it, but you can at least say that I have a reference that at least shows that this is the, the correct choice, right? A correct choice, right? So again, there's not just one right answer, but it's a pretty good answer.
Anywho, um, again, you can see some uh, Neisseria coverage here, some gonorrhea coverage. Um, you know, not going to cover many other gram negatives. So no pseudomonas coverage, anything like that. So um, again, not really going to cover things like UTIs. You never see it really being used for that, um, but good for a lot of respiratory tract infections. The other additional benefit, and so again, this is where, especially when you get into things like pneumonias, this is where that toss up between say like amoxicillin versus like a macrolide may become a little bit more iffy, right? So again, when you're thinking about atypicals, this is where you're going to be thinking about things like Legionella, mycoplasma, chlamydia, things like that, things that can cause pneumonias. Um, if you suspect your patient has an atypical infection, notice with the penicillins, do we ever mention atypicals? Not at all, right? So that has no atypical coverage. Zithromycin and the other macrolides do. So that's one of its uh, kind of unique sort of features there. It covers atypical bugs. So if you have someone, especially like an older patient, say, or not older, but say older than a PEDS patient, you suspect they have an atypical uh, uh, pneumonia, this is what you're going to use for them in a lot of cases, okay? So again, whenever I mention atypical coverage, kind of make a note of that because it's going to come up a few other times as we go forward here, okay? Anyway, um, again, not clinically used for anaerobes and no gut infection, but again, mostly the respiratory tract is where we're going to see a lot of use of the macrolides for the most part. Okay, so just to kind of back that up, you see, uh, you know, cap, uh, cutositis media, cap is just community-acquired pneumonia, uh, pharyngitis, sinusitis, all that good stuff. I, I don't see a whole lot of it being used for skin uh, structure infections. Um, the one exception to that would be potentially like erythromycin being used topically. What's the benefit of using an antibiotic topically versus like, say, systemically? It may get absorbed in the area. What's the other benefit, though, as far as like, say, concentrations go? Yeah, so less toxic effects uh, systemically. That's one good benefit. <laughs> What about the levels of the drug? Very high, very localized, right? So again, if I have like a skin uh, infection, even if it may be something that may look like it's resistant to erythromycin, if I get a high enough concentration right there, it's not causing uh, toxicity all over the body, that's gonna be a good thing. So sometimes topical use can be used there. But um, the other things you may see some kind of unique uses for it include things like mycobacterium avium complex that is a uh, opportunistic infection you may see like in cancer patients more often than not in aids patients uh, that can be a unique thing you see with that we'll talk more about that in the poem section later on um, chlamydia can be used to cover this very frequently you're going to find that gonorrhea is best friends with chlamydia those infections tend to come together for for some of your patients with stds and so very frequently they get a shot of ceftriaxone and they get a dose of zithromax Right? They get those two together to make sure you're getting uh, coverage for, for chlamydia and then the ceftriaxone will cover the gonorrhea. Okay, so those are two commonly used together. Um, when you think about STD treatment, um, how long do you want the treatment duration to be? Short, long? Typically pretty short. If you can get things with one dose, that's pretty good, right? Because again, these are sometimes patients who are not gonna have great follow-up um, when they're presenting to you. So you wanna make sure if I can just give them a one-time dose and have a pretty good chance of have a clinical cure, that's gonna be good for those patients, right? So this is nice because azithromycin has a long half-life. You just give them a one-time dose, you don't have to worry about chlamydia for that patient, right? Uh, unlikely to have a resistant sort of strain of that. And then another thing, H. pylori, where do we find H. pylori? In the stomach specifically, what is the cause? Peptic yeah, peptic ulcers, right? So again, it's a very common cause for peptic ulcers. What's the other most common cause for peptic ulcers? Could be stress, but what's the other more common thing? How about drug related? It's a farm class, right? NSAIDs, right? NSAIDs, ibuprofen, aspirin, naproxen, things like that, right? So um, typically, if you have a patient with a peptic ulcer, you ask, hey, do you take NSAIDs? And you go, no, you can test them for H. pylori. It's usually the, the common role of things, right? So again, you'll see this in combination. You may see chlorothromycin plus uh, moxicillin. So this is actually double coverage. This is one of those rare cases where you do double cover. And then something like lansoprazole. We'll talk about PPIs later mm -hmm. on in the GI section. I think actually it's in farm too, so we've got a ways to go. But um, sometimes you'll see that in these combination uh, drug uh, packets. That's a good question. Um, if I had to think back to the last time I looked this up, I believe that sometimes you'll find that things like um, gonorrhea can sometimes make the environment a little bit more viable for things like chlamydia to take hold or vice versa. So um, they just kind of like one another. They just tend to co-infect. So if you get someone who's positive for gonorrhea, you just assume they have chlamydia too and just treat for both of them. Because uh, again, you don't want, if you don't see that patient ever again, right, you know, if they live a lifestyle where they're not going to be likely to come back for follow-up, you at least want to treat them and make sure they don't pass it on to someone else, right? Um, and again, that's why we're also seeing changes in laws to where um, we can treat their partners without ever actually seeing them, right? You can write a prescription for them as well. So that way, because you know that the, if they have it, the partner probably has it as well, right? So and it's probably not a satisfactory answer. There's probably research out there that I invite you to go look at if you want to report back to us. Absolutely, go for it. That's a true goal that sounds smart. It's like give someone else the job of looking something up. Just kidding.
Um, anyway, so adverse effects you're going to find here. So with the, and, you know, I mentioned with, um, with with antibiotics, you know, GI upset, right? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You're going to see that with every single drug. This tends to be a little bit more prominent with the the macrolides, and the reason for that is is that especially with things like erythromycin. Remember when we were talking about the GI tract and all the different receptors that kind of stimulate a peristalsis? Anyone remember the motilin receptor? We didn't talk about it too much, but there's actually a modal interceptor that when you stimulate it, stimulates peristalsis, okay? The drugs in the macrolide category, like azithromycin, erythromycin especially, tend to stimulate the modal interceptors and can stimulate peristalsis and eventually defecation. Mm -hmm. So you see with these drugs a tendency to have a lot of abdominal cramping due to that peristalsis, diarrhea associated with this. Um, and in fact, in a lot of patients who have issues with impaired peristalsis, we will give them things like erythromycin, not for an infection, but more for to increase that, that, stimulate, uh, that peristalsis and increase uh, gastric intestinal time, right? Try to speed up the gastrointestinal time, I should say. So anyway, that's one thing you're going to use it for is you see a, a you know, patient being given erythromycin sort of – because typically when you write a prescription for uh, an antibiotic, what's a really important thing to include? So you have the dose, you have the amount to dispense, but you also want to include the, the route. Yes, you want to include route. Indication. Indication, yes. What else? Side effects. No, side effects. Duration of therapy, right? You want to include – because you don't want these patients to be on antibiotics forever, right? It's not like hypertension where you're going to treat it for a lifetime potentially. These are typically at five days, ten days. If you see someone who's on erythromycin with no stop date on it, typically it's for something like motility. So if you ever see that, that's what it's for. Of course, allergic reactions can happen with this. Of course, uh, things like you know, cholestatic hepatitis. Sometimes it's seen with certain salts of these drugs, uh, especially like the estylate salt of erythromycin. Um, the other things to know here, though, are going to be things like transient hearing loss. Okay, anytime you see these side effects that are like you know either permanent or kind of unique to a class, like, those are things you want to, to note. Like just like we noted, ototoxicity for uh, vancomycin. Note here as well that large IV doses, especially if they're given quickly, um, can uh, cause transient hearing loss, especially if they have renal insufficiency and they can't clear the drug. That's another case. We may see that as well. Okay. Now, another unique sort of new side effect we're going to be talking about today is going to be QT prolongation and eventual torsades to points. Or I don't really know my French that well to say, I guess, torsade de point. I don't know. But anyway, um, I'll just say torsades from here on out. Anyway, what you're going to find is that the macrolides can cause an extension of the QT interval. Now, if you remember back to when we talked about cardiology, what is the QT interval? Yeah, so the time it takes from the time the ventricles depolarize, right? Because on the EKG, ventricular depolarization is what? Which wave? QRS, right? QRS is ventricular depolarization. Then we have the T wave, which is? Repolarization. Ventricular repolarization, right? Which wave is atrial repolarization? You don't ever really see it. Yeah, you never really see it, right? Because the QRS is covering it up. Anyway, um, but the QT interval is showing you that time between when the ventricle depolarizes to when it is going to be repolarized. If you extend that out, and very frequently that is done by blocking up potassium channels. Now, if you remember my analogy for ion content inside and outside of a cardiac cell, really most cells, what was it? Salt wrap banana. banana, right? So you got a lot of potassium inside the cardiac cell. If I block the output, flow of potassium from those cells, you're going to delay that repolarization. And by doing that, you're altering the refractory period, right? Remember, the refractory periods uh, can change uh, how long or how much, uh, you know, how long before another signal can come along and stimulate that cell again. So by extending that out, you increase the chances of having an uh, aberrant arrhythmia develop, and you call it uh, torsades. It's kind of a unique thing you see with this QT prolongation you see with that, okay? Now, if I give someone a macrolide, are they going to have torsades? Probably not, right? It's very rare that you would actually see that. The people you do have to worry about, though, are going to be those who have a congenital prolonged QT, which, again, hopefully they would know that. Sometimes it hasn't been diagnosed yet, especially like in young kids and things like that. But you know, if you ever have someone who has like a syncopal episode that's kind of unexplained, you're probably going to work them up for like a prolonged QT, things like that. Um, but if you know that, it's good to know. Uh, and then also if they are on other antiarrhythmics, other drugs that prolong QT, or if they have like an electrolyte abnormality, like say uh, changes in calcium or, or potassium levels, those can all exacerbate that, right? The place where I see this more frequently is when I have patients who are multiple drugs who are, can all prolong the QT, right? So if I have someone who's on a macrolide plus say fluoroquinolone plus um, an antiarrhythmic, they can extend their QT out pretty long and that can make them more at risk for developing torsades, okay? Anyone know what a normal QT interval is? 20 milliseconds. Usually like 440, it's a little bit longer in females, like 450. Um, you know, you'll have patients who will get up in the 500, 600. 600 is like when I'm starting to really worry about uh, torsades developing there. So that's something you want to at least be, be aware of. Right?
Anyway, showing you this again at the molecular level, you're basically blocking that potassium efflux. This is the intracellular area, this is extracellular. If you can't have potassium leaving, you're going to be extending out that time it takes to have that repolarization occur. Okay, and so when you see that, you're going to find you get this nice. Uh, they call it twisting of the points. That's what the, the French. Uh, uh, that's what the the translation is there. And so you get this really funky looking ventricular arrhythmia. Again, not really sustainable for life. Uh, and so when you see that, what do you? Anyone know what you give them? It's an ion, it's a cation. Magnesium. So magnesium is going to be the treatment of choice for torsades. Something to keep in the back of your mind. Is the TC a little different in the pediatric population versus adult? Yeah. So you'll see a lot of those intervals tend to change a little bit for uh, pediatric populations. Um, again, it changes enough to where I just kind of consult the EKG. I kind of look at it and if it tells me it's prolonged, I'm like, okay, it looks prolonged, right? Because uh, again, depending on a neonate versus a young child versus a teenager, usually by the time, uh, <laughs> usually I'm referencing this stuff, I'm just mainly talking about adults for the most part. A good question. Other things to note about the macrolides, and again, we're going to see this thing rear its ugly head every now and then, but remember the SIP enzyme system? What did that do for us? Metabolizes the drugs, right? So again, uh, what's the number one most common one you're going to run into affecting drugs? Cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450. Which one though? 3A4. 3A4, over half the drugs we have that get metabolized by SIP enzymes go through 3A4. So this is a big one, right? So you're going to find that as far as SIP interactions go, typically erythromycin is going to be the most frequently to cause this. Clarithromycin, then followed by azithromycin, has the least interaction here. But it is going to be inhibiting the effects of SIP3A, and more predominantly SIP3A4, meaning what is that going to do to levels of other drugs that get metabolized by SIP3A4? increase those levels, right? Because I'm inhibiting the enzyme. The enzyme cannot metabolize those drugs as well. Those levels are going to go up, okay? So if I had a test question and say, I'm giving my patient uh, erythromycin for, say, for instance, a uh, bacterial sinusitis, they're also on a drug that is a CYP3A4 substrate. What do you expect that level of that drug to do? You would say increase, right? Because again, I'm inhibiting set 3 4 those levels should go up in those cases, right? So that's where you can see issues with things like, you know, the statins. The statins we use for hyperlipidemia. You can cause rhabdomyolysis mm -hmm. and liver failure uh, if you have those levels go up too high, right? So this is a very clinically important thing to know. Um, there's a whole host of drugs. Uh, in fact, if you look at Lexicomp and go to the interaction checker, you're going to see things like erythromycin. It's a mile long because it affects set 3 a 4 It affects all these different drugs here, okay? So instead of memorizing every single drug that goes to 3 a 4 what can you do instead? Don't memorize it. Look it up, right? You can Google it. You can, uh, I wouldn't suggest Google specifically, but you can go to Lexicomp. You can go to uh, Micromedics, Clinical Pharmacology, whatever reference you want to go to, Hippocrates, whatever. They should give you a list there, right? So anytime you have someone you're going to be giving uh, a macrolide to, check their medication profile, right? Put in all their drugs. It may be laborious. It may be on 15 different drugs. Check it out. You might actually find some new drug interactions you even know about that's already on their profile, right? Um, but you can find that and try to determine what you need to do with that. Maybe an amacrylide is not a great option for them, or maybe you need to adjust the dose of their other drug. Maybe adjust it down in order to counteract for that, okay? Make sense? Okay. Profile. Uh, up next, we have the tetracyclines. This includes uh, tetracycline itself, doxycycline, and minocycline. Does anyone know what you call it when you put a dachshund on a bicycle? Doxycycline, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, seeing who's still awake. Uh, right, so the mechanism here, they're also going to be inhibiting these ribosomes, so the mechanism is going to be very uh, similar to, to the macrolide. So again, in your mind, you can think about these both as being protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, these are also going to be bacteriostatic. These are also going to be pretty broad spectrum. You can use doxycycline for a lot of different indications as we're going to see here in just a few minutes. So good coverage for anaerobes, good coverage for gram negatives, good coverage for gram positives. This does it all. However, we're going to see there's some severe drawbacks to its use as we're going to see in a few minutes here, right? Um, normally, you're going to see things like tetracycline, minocycline. They use it a lot. Uh, uh, PO. Very rarely do we use IV doxycycline. Actually, this is one of the cool drugs we use uh, for kind of an odd indication. Uh, we have an interventional radiology program at Nemours. And so sometimes what you'll find is that certain drugs can be very, very um, uh, damaging to the vascular endothelium. So sometimes we need to do, um, basically we need to uh, sclerose these veins to close them off. They have like venous malformations and things like that. And so sometimes what they'll use is use doxycycline to actually inject it. They'll take a line, get it up right up to the vascular malformation. They'll inject this doxy doxycycline, try to sclerose that vein off. So it's kind of a cool, kind of unique use for it. Not important for our purposes right now, unless you decide to go to IR one day, but 
Um, these drugs have really good coverage for a lot of things. We have things like atypical bugs. Um, if you have an animal-borne organism like Yersinia pestis, anyone know what that causes? The plague, right? Bubonic plague, uh, uh, you know, uh, rickettsia, brucella, a lot of different sort of uh, things. You know, and in fact, if you were to ever have, uh, say, a, a biological attack using some sort of bacteria, uh, chances are doxycycline is going to be one of the drugs that actually gets dispersed out from like things like the CDC. You actually have a uh, strategic national stockpile of different drugs and antidotes and things like that around the country. This is one of the things that they will stock because it will cover a lot of these agents that could be potentially used in a biological uh, attack. Um, this also covers a lot of good gram positives, enterococcus, MRSA is going to cover um, treponema palladium. Anyone know what that causes? <laughs> Syphilis. Syphilis. Thank you. There you go. Um, absolutely. So uh, H. pylori. Uh, it does not cover pseudomonas, unfortunately. It does not cover C. diff. So there's a couple of holes for it. Now, the question is, like, well, why don't we just use this for everything? Well, we don't have to worry about uh, things like resistance popping up and whatnot, but there's also a lot of drawbacks to its use as well. So we'll see. Would it be um, similar to, like, the atomic bomb? Or not? Um... We don't use it in the same, that's a good question. Yeah, and that's probably a good answer for me. Um, um, I would say that it could potentially have that kind of similar coverage. I mean, it's not going to get things like, you know, really nasty gram negative resistant bugs like, you know, Acinetobacter and um, Klebsiella, like, you know, producing things like, you know, ASBLs. It's not going to get that stuff, right? This it does have good broad coverage, so, you know, um, you know, if you had a skin infection, this will probably cover, right? You know, if you had something like um, UTI, maybe it'll cover. But you're going to find that it has a pretty limited use spectrum, as we'll see here, mainly due to the, a lot of the side effects that it has. So you're going to see that it doesn't really have the same utility from an IV standpoint, like you'd use like an ICU sort of patient. But good question. I think that, that is a good question based on kind of how we're talking about coverage. You would think, that, yeah, this covers everything. I'll just give it for everything. Not quite the same as you would see with the carbapenems, right? Um, anyway, so big uses for this. You'll see a lot of tetracyclines being used for acne because we're going to be able to kill those anaerobic. Uh, bugs as we get to the derm section we'll find anaerobes are a big uh, player there for for causing acne it's going to be able to good uh, for atypical pneumonias so again if you think someone has a uh, say a chlamydia uh, multifilia if you think they have uh, legionella mycoplasma pneumonia this is going to be good in addition to something like an, uh, a macrolide these are both could cover an atypical sort of pneumonia right uh, i mentioned animal borne diseases uh, some stds chlamydia uh, it can be treated with doxycycline it's kind of falling out of favor due to resistance now is this a mite is it Mycin is used a lot more frequently. However, one of the things you're going to see is, as far as drug interactions go, this will chelate with cations. When I say chelate, what does that mean? Not fall out. It's going to bind to other things, right? So remember when we were talking about food drug interactions before? We kind of mentioned uh, kind of obliquely in pharmacodynamics, talking about things like you know with older patients, you're worried about osteoporosis, so you tell them to drink a lot of what? A lot of milk, right? So they get a lot of calcium. Calcium is going to bind up these, these tetracyclines. Uh, iron will bind up with these tetracyclines as well, which means that when they bind up, do you absorb them very well? Nope, not at all, right? So again, you can have a patient who you're giving a, uh, this drug to, uh, you know, doxycycline to or aminocycline to for their infection. They're taking it like they should, but they're not getting clinically any better. Check to see if there's some sort of drug food interaction that could be accounting for this, right? Other problems you run into is you can have some photosensitivity. It's more of a problem here in Florida, especially when they're getting out in the summertime. So make sure they're you know covering up, make sure they're wearing a lot of sunscreen, things like that. The other big things you need to be aware of are going to be this discoloration of the teeth that can happen here. Okay. Now this is going to be seen a lot more doxycycline uh, than you see with the say the other tetracyclines. So basically what this means is there's certain patients you cannot use tetracyclines in. Patients who are less than eight years old. Why is that? They're still developing their, their adult set of teeth, right? So again, their baby teeth, I don't really care if those are stained so much, right? They're going to lose those. But the adult teeth, those are going to still be developing, and those are going to stain them. It's actually staining the bone as well because, again, I mentioned that it chelates with cations. So namely, which cation is found in the bone? Calcium, right? So it's binding up to that calcium. So this is why you have that staining. Additionally, you cannot give this to a pregnant patient specifically in the second and third trimester, right? Because what's developing that little fetus? all their bones too, right? So you don't want to be messing with that. In addition to binding that calcium, it can also cause some depression of skeletal growth, which is why we don't use it in those pregnant patients, okay? So avoid it in pregnant patients, specifically the second and third trimester. Avoid using in kids less than eight years of age, okay? There's only going to be a few drugs we'll talk about where I say you cannot use it in this age patient. You know, we talked about ceftriaxone, cannot use in which age range? Less than 30 days. Doxycycline, minocycline, cannot use less than eight years of age, okay? Good to know for that sort of stuff. And then, again, it has to be reasonably dose-adjusted, like many other things we've talked about, so again, watch for that.
Okay. Uh, a similar drug that falls in this category. This one's kind of uh, one of the reserved ones we try to keep for more resistant sort of uh, infections there. But this one is called uh, tigacycline. I am convinced they name it such because look at this molecule. What does it look like to you? Use a little bit of imagination. There's a little body. And there's a little tail coming off of it. Kind of looks like a tiger. A little bit. Anyway, but look at the marketing. I'll even show you the marketing here in a second. But tigacil is the, the this actually fits into the same category as the other uh, tetracyclines. It's really good coverage against several different things, um, but still it's bacteriostatic. One of the things you're going to find with, and I kind of mentioned this uh, yesterday, I believe, is that when you have someone with a depressed immune system, what would you rather use, a bactericidal drug or a bacteriostatic drug? Usually, Usually cidal, right? So again, with these really sick patients, sometimes a bacteriostatic drug is not going to be great for them because they can't really fight off the infection on their own. So there are some drawbacks to using something like this. However, tigacycline gets uh, a lot of really good coverage. It can cover things like E. coli that's really resistant, um, E. fecalis, uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, but it'll get E. fecalis. MRSA is going to get a lot of other these kind of resistant bugs um, that can pop up for some of these like ICU patients. They can also be used for a lot of complicated intra-abdominal infections because it can cover anaerobes and will cover gram negatives. So this is usually something we will hold back and save until patients uh, show through cultures that they have something that is going to be specifically uh, susceptible just to this and not really much else. Because again, we don't want to have a lot of resistance to it because then we lose that. Uh, but look at this marketing. Come on. You try and tell me they didn't get the same idea I had when I looked at that molecule. <laughs> Tiger's right. There's also a nice orange color, which I kind of like. I like uh, drugs that have like a specific color to them. So there's some that are like bright, bright red. This one's orange. Uh, so sometimes you can see a little bit of discoloration of like skin uh, or uh, usually like tears and things like that can be discolored sometimes by these drugs. Uh, this is one example of that. But can you imagine how cool would you be in the hospital if you had a tiger with you <laughs> walking through? No patient would give you any guff, I, I, I assure you. <laughs> But anyway, again, uh, it's nice from a standpoint. It doesn't have a whole lot of side effects associated that is unique to it versus any other antibiotic, but it is something we like to hold back and, and save uh, for those more uh, complicated sort of uh, infections. Okay, moving on, we next we have our aminoglycosides. So this uh, three we're going to see here includes amikacin, gentamicin, and tobramycin. Okay. Uh, with the coverage here is that these are completely gram negative, gram negative only. There's only one kind, of, one kind of rare instance where you might use it for a gram positive, which I'll mention in a second here. But again, this is going to have really good coverage against pseudomonas. It's going to be able to hit things like your Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, all those Enterobacteriaceae. It's going to cover those, which is great. Uh, not going to cover any gram positive for the most part. The only time you might use that is when we uh, talk about synergy dosing. Occasionally, when you have a patient who has uh, endocarditis, right, so they have an infection of the heart valve, um, you're going to find that they can develop uh, enterococcus as one of the bugs that can uh, be more likely to be seen there. Sometimes we will use something like penicillin in addition to gentamicin for synergy, right? When I say synergy, what does that mean in this case? Yeah, they work better together, essentially, right? So in these cases there, you can have something like a cell wall active agent breaking down the cell wall, that enterococcus, and then maybe the aminoglycosides can get in there to actually stop, start to inhibit the, the protein synthesis, right? Because these, again, are going to be protein synthesis inhibitors, okay? Um, so anyway, so very good gram-native coverage. Now, we used to give this drug every eight hours. That was kind of traditional dosing, but we realized that it actually it has concentration-dependent killing, so because of that, it means we can give it much less frequently. So usually you're going to see a lot of these aminoglycosides given every 24 hours. This is very good because, again, when you have something that you're giving, say, every eight hours, what do you think the levels are prior to the next dose? Are they zero or are they still probably above the MIC of the bug? Probably above the MIC, right? What we're going to find is that when you have higher levels of these drugs building up over time, and again, these are going to be ones that are completely renally eliminated. That's when you're going to see more toxicity. And we're going to see, just like we mentioned earlier, ototoxicity is a big thing you see with this. Nephrotoxicity is a big thing you see with these drugs. So if I can give them one big dose one time a day, get those levels really high, and then I have the post-antibiotic effect, by the time they get their next dose of drug, the level is zero, right? So they're not accumulating any drug. They never really get to a steady state because the level is zero by the time they get the next dose. So that's, again, one of the benefits of using um, our knowledge about how we kill off these bacteria to make sure we're uh, trying to have safer dosing paradigms for, for our patients. That makes sense? Anyway, um, so again, this is a really good drug of choice for febrile neutropenia. And we talked about things like cefepime. Sometimes um, you're going to find that as far as double coverage goes, pseudomonas is another bug that you typically want to double cover for. Because pseudomonas can be so devastating, typically you want to double cover for it because in case one of the drugs doesn't work, the other one hopefully is going to be working. Okay, And so a lot of times you're going to see cefepime, which is uh, what kind of drug? It's a cephalosporin, namely it's a fourth generation cephalosporin with anti <coughs> coverage. You're going to see cefepime plus gentamicin, or maybe you'll see something like zosin, which is piperacillin and tazobactam plus 
tobramycin, something like that, a combination there where you have two anti-pseudomonal drugs together. And then once you get those results back, as far as the cultures go, then you can scale it down. Okay. So again, this, uh, pseudomonas is another bug you're going to double cover for in a lot of cases. Okay. Anyway, um, a lot of sepsis cases are going to be treated with uh, uh, an aminoglycoside, and I mentioned the enterococcal synergy there as well. Now, again, this is another drug we have to do therapeutic drug monitoring on. Namely, we're going to be looking for those troughs because in the case of vancomycin, which is a time-dependent killer, we want those troughs to be above the MIC of the bug, right? Here, we're actually shooting to make sure that the levels are negligible. If the levels are too high, then we may actually have to extend out how frequently we give this drug. So maybe if I give a dose to a patient every 24 hours, I check a trough, right before the next dose, and it comes back high, and I say, okay, well, they are not clearing this very well. Maybe I'll give it to them every 36 hours. Maybe I'll give it to them every 48 hours, whatever the case may be, in order to make sure they can clear that effectively. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so anyway, uh, just some ideas of dosing. Again, I'm not going to ask you dosing on the test, so don't freak out about that. And again, you can see here that typically when we're looking at those levels, we want troughs below a certain level to make sure they're clearing it as best they can, right? Um, again, make sure you're not checking a level too early. Typically, third or fourth dose is where we want to be checking for that uh, to make sure that we're getting accurate levels because in case they are hitting a steady state, we want to be able to look for that. Uh, up next, we have a oxazolidinidione. Don't worry about saying that. You can say Zyvox. We have linazolid or Zyvox. You're going to find there's lots of weird categories of drugs that um, are going to be quite difficult to say. But Zyvox, linazolid is another good drug. What happens if you have vancomycin not being effective? You say you're giving a patient vancomycin and it comes back and they have MRSA. It's not even MRSA anymore. Now it's VRSA. Right, or it's vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Um, those are really nasty gram positive bugs. This is where you're going to use Zyvox. Okay, linazolid is going to be a very good backup agent to this. Um, this is good for multi drug resistant uh, pneumococcus, MRSA, VRE. This is a drug we do not like to give uh, unless we really need to. We like to hold this back because once you have stuff that's resistant to this, again, there's not a whole lot left you can go to in a lot of cases. Okay, very good for. Um, you know, hospital-acquired MRSA. Occasionally, we'll do it for community-acquired MRSA. The really big benefit with this drug is that it is not renally eliminated. So because of that, I don't have to worry about renal function in order to determine how I dose this drug, which makes it very easy to dose this drug. The other benefit to this, as opposed to vancomycin, is I can give this orally. So I can give it orally, I'll get good systemic absorption, and I can treat those infections. So the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, this is easier to use. I'm going to use it for all my patients. Again, not appropriate. You want to save this one for when you have something the vancomycin is not going to be able to kill. Okay? Uh, other interactions you want to be careful of, uh, thrombocytopenia, this can cause that. One of the other really unique sort of interactions here is this actually inhibits the enzyme monoamine oxidase. Do you remember where we saw monoamine oxidase previously? Serotonin. Serotonin. Norepi. 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 Dopamine. Dopamine. Epinephrine, right? That is an enzyme that is used to metabolize your catecholamines. Now, remember, if you remember back to my examples, and again, you're like, man, physiology, I just felt like another farm class. You'll see this is why this is important, because it comes up in farm class all the time. Anyway, so the reason I covered that was because um, when you have drugs on board that are going to be extending the half-life of things like serotonin, norepi, things like that, these can be very synergistic. So, for instance, if I have a patient, and again, um, yeah, say I have a patient who's coming in for sepsis, right, and we determine they have vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, I need to give them linazolid. However, Comorbid condition they have is depression. A lot of patients who are, have depression are on SSRIs. Anyone remember what that stands for? Or knows what that stands for? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So if I have linazolid on board, which is blocking metabolism of serotonin, and I have a drug on board that is blocking reuptake of serotonin, what do you think that does to serotonin levels in the synapse? They're going to go up sky high. And so because of that, this is where you can have something called serotonin syndrome that can develop. You can see severe toxicity from that. Okay, I'm going to cover that more when we get to the behavioral health section later on. But just know that this is a very severe interaction. People have died from this potentially uh, due to not being able to recognize this, okay? So just be aware. Um, the other thing, remember, we mentioned that tyramine was a precursor to a lot of your catecholamines. If you have a patient taking in a lot of tyramine-containing foods, aged uh, meats, cheeses, red wine, all your kind of bougie foods you'd see, like <laughs> old rich people eating probably, um, they're not good candidates for that because they would end up having uh, very high levels of serotonin and other catecholamines, right? So just be aware of that. Uh, but even things like pseudoephedrine, right? Pseudoephedrine, where do you find pseudoephedrine at? Pseudofed, it's a decongestion found in a lot of cough and cold products, right? So again, where do you find pseudoephed specifically if you went to like say Walgreens? Is it out on the shelf? No, it's behind the counter. The stuff you get on the shelf that says pseudoephed PE, 
it's crap. Don't buy this stuff, right? It's phenylephrine. It's no good. Go behind the counter. Make sure not, when you physically don't go behind the counter, the pharmacist will be very mad at you. Um, but ask them for the actual pseudofed that contains pseudoephedrine. That stuff works much better. But if I had a patient who had a monoamine oxidase inhibitor like Zyvox on board, plus a pseudoephedrine, you can see very severe hypertension develop. People would stroke out. It's no good, right? Um, I mentioned this to... I uh, mentioned this to you earlier today, but I guess going behind the counter as a, as a theme here, I mentioned, um, you know, I did not work retail much uh, as, a, as a youngster in my pharmacy school days. The reason for that was is I did an internship at CVS, and my second day we got robbed at Knife Point uh, for our uh, hydrocodone. Uh, and I said, this probably isn't the place for me. So I said, I'm going to go to the hospital and work there. And if I get robbed there, then I say, you know what, pharmacy is just not for me. I'm going to do <laughs> something else. So anyway, that, that, was, that was that story. Anywho, um, another really good drug that you could use in addition to, uh, you know, if you had a, a vancomycin resistant enterococcus or something that, uh, that uh, vancomycin is not going to work for, you also have a drug called daptomycin. Uh, the brand name for this one's called Cubicin. Again, this is only going to cover gram positives, okay? These are things you're going to reserve for those really sick of, of the sick patients who vancomycin doesn't work for. Um, the cool thing about, uh, you know, Zyvox is just going to be inhibiting uh, protein synthesis. So again, um, we've seen drugs that do that. Daptomycin has a really cool, uh, kind of cool interaction here or cool mechanism where actually what it does is it causes bacterial depolarization that kind of depolarizes the whole cell and actually disrupts all the DNA, the RNA, and all the protein synthesis. So this one's really bactericidal, basically just depolarizes and kind of shocks the cell to death, essentially. Um, one thing to note here is it is going to be, uh, you want to watch for CPK levels. Anyone know what CPK stands for? Creatine phosphokinase, right? What, what did someone say? I missed that. Oh, Cal, Yes. California Pizza Kitchen, that is what that refers to. <laughs> Are your levels too high? That is, that is the question. Uh, no, that is uh, creatine phosphokinase. Uh, that is a what will be left out of the muscle when it starts to break down. So you can actually see rhabdomyolysis develop um, with, with daptomycin. So you do need to be careful for that. They're going to cause a lot of myalgias as well. Because again, not only is it depolarizing these bacterial cells, but it can also depolarize the muscles as well. And so you can see where that may, may occur there. Now, one thing is uh, of note here, you cannot use daptomycin for pneumonias. The reason for that is because the actual the pleural fluid and then actually the surfactant in the lungs will deactivate the drug whatever reason it does that right so it's good for skin infections good for other stuff not going to be good for pneumonia the surfactant is just going to, to break it down it's not going to be able to do its uh, job zyvoxo you definitely could use for for uh, pneumonia no problem okay so any questions before i leave you your head spinning mind's full of knowledge Fantastic. Review some of the stuff. Just kind of look at it just a little bit because, again, more repetition is going to help it stick in your mind. You're going to facilitate those little neuron connections that are being made right now. I'll see you guys later.